Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning, and it's my honor to welcome you here on behalf of uh, the city of The Hague. And I want to start with uh, thanking Justice Breyer for uh, giving his name uh, to this lecture, and um, it's our honor uh, to be able to, to use his, his name. I also want to thank Brookings for its hospitality, and I want to congratulate you on your centennial. It was in 1916 um, when Robert Brookings worked with government reformers to create this first independent institution devoted to political study, to fact-based study of public policy. Fact-based, and that's so needed in these days. And today, it's an honor to listen to such distinguished speakers as uh, Michel Koning, president of Eurogist, um, Professor Co already introduced, Abby Williams, who as a president of the prestigious The Hague Institute of Global Justice will be our skilled moderator today. And you all expected to hear Art van der Steur, the Netherlands Minister for Justice and Security. But the minister has decided to stay in The Hague in view of the, the letter to parliament uh, that has to come and the many questions that need to be answered in the run-up to the debate next week about the Brussels attacks. And of course, we regret very much that he is not here, but as a politician, I understand fully why he stayed in The Hague. The Brookings Institute, institution is most influential, most quoted, and the most trusted think tank in the world. So this is the place, and this is the time to discuss crucial matters together. And I think it's excellent that this meeting is being jointly hosted by Brookings and the Hague Institute for Global Justice. Our mayor, Mr. Van Aertsen, and the former American Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, serve as the founding father and founding mother of the Institute. And earlier this year, our mayor had a personal conversation with the Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And during this meeting, Mr. Van Aertsen said that the city of The Hague is promoting UN Sustainable Development Goal 16 for peace, justice, and strong institutions. And in this area, the city of The Hague has a reputation to maintain. We are internationally known and recognized as a legal capital of the world. We have a strong tradition in the areas of peace, justice, and the institutions. And we see opportunities for development. And therefore, we cooperate with, for example, the renowned Asser Institute on International Law. These days, there is much interest in the development of knowledge in the field of cybersecurity. And this is exactly where The Hague can contribute. In this field, we are the gateway to Europe, thanks to collaboration between businesses, government bodies, and knowledge institutes, regional, national, and international. And the use of this triple helix cooperation is a condition for success. In fact, the message these days is very straightforward. Do cooperate. Commerce, think tanks, government bodies. If everyone stays inside their own safe environment, no innovation is possible. But if you put the ha your head above your own organization's fence, you can come up we can come up with solutions no one ever could think of. Today, the topic of the Justice Breyer Lecture on, on the International Law is the emerging law of 21st century war, a subject that really matters. I could mention the recent atrocities in Brussels and Turkey, the continuing strife and unrest in the Middle East, and the conflicts in Africa. This is a time for reflections, time for new insights, time for new initiatives. There's only one way to emerge from these crises, cooperation, national and international. The Hague Security Delta already has a wealth of knowledge in the field of cybersecurity. The cyber world promises, promises many benefits. We have an incredible amount of digital information available to us. And the smart use of this data, for instance, big data for humanity, or for peace, as it's known, can be used to avert conflicts, maybe even wars. And The Hague wants to take the lead in all this. 
But digitalization brings new problems with it as well. Critical infrastructure comes under pressure if criminals can take control of it. We need now new international regulations and laws in the digital world. And another question today is, how do we protect digital privacy in a world without borders, where terrorism has to be dealt with? There are many more questions popping up when you think in this respect about our topic, the emerging law of the 21st century war. So let's share our vision, be open to each other. Brookings can help us to bring our best, very best qualities to the surface. And we will need to do that to get closer to a safer and more just world. And the city of The Hague wants to be your partner in this. I wish you a very pleasant lecture and I do invite Professor Coe to the stage. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, thank you. Thank you to Sponsoring institution, uh, the Brookings Institution, with whom I've had such a wonderful cooperation uh, over the years. Uh, the city of The Hague, uh, which I've visited uh, and admired for uh, decades, uh, and the Hague Institute for Global Justice under its uh, brilliant leader, Abby Williams. Um, it is a great honor to be here to deliver uh, this lecture. Uh, my own perspectives as uh, Strobe described, are having been a, an international law professor for 35 years, 20 years as a human rights lawyer, 10 years in the US government, and five years as dean of a law school. Don't add these up, some of these are uh, overlapping. But in each of these capacities, I've had the great honor to uh, work from and learn from Justice Stephen Breyer, who is uh, our great uh, transnationalist justice of this era. He follows in a tradition of justices mentioned here, just to single out two, Melville Fuller and former President William Howard Taft, were founders of the American Society of International Law uh, almost 100 years ago. And it is Justice Breyer who, in his various works and his uh, most recent book, The Court in the World, his opinions has uh, thought, sought to give the decent respect to the opinions of mankind that the Declaration of Independence originally mandated. If there is a core idea that drives his transnationalist jurisprudence, it's simply this, that there is a transnational public law emerging rooted in shared norms that have a similar meaning in every national system. For example, the idea of cruel and human or degrading treatment uh, civil society internally displaced, and the emerging uh, law of transborder trafficking. What I want to talk today about is the emerging law of 21st century war, uh, which I think has been in many ways the most discussed and the least understood of these bodies of law. And here I am again uh, going to pay special tribute to my friend and mentor Strobe Talbot with whom uh, we had worked together during the uh, Clinton administration, particularly during the Kosovo crisis. But when we got to Yale in uh, September 2001, one of the first discussions we had after 9-11 was about whether this would be a situation where law would be abandoned or whether law would be modified to address the whole range of emerging problems. And it was Strobe's commitment, which I very much shared, that the law might change, but there would be law. We would not enter what you could call a law-free zone. And what we've seen in the years since is that new tools of 21st century law have emerged, cyber conflict, drones, special operations, private security contractors, now increasingly discussion about autonomous and semi-autonomous robots. And people ask the question, uh, what are the rules? Uh, what is the emerging law of the 21st century? And there are two basic competing notions that come into play. A notion put forward by some is the notion that we are in a law-free zone, 
that because these technologies did not previously exist, that there is no law to apply, or that there is a world of legal black holes, places like Guantanamo or tribunals, which don't have to answer to law, like military commissions. But the other view, which is the one that I think has prevailed, is the notion that we are in a moment where we translate what Montesquieu calls the spirit of the laws to the present day situation. There are many interpreters, but it's extremely important that this translation exercise occur, in particularly because we are in a time when both the domestic and international legislative systems are in stalemate and peculiarly paralyzed. So if there is law to be applied, it is law that derives from the spirit of the laws that governed 20th century and 19th century conflicts. And what it takes only a moment of reflection to see is that there is a big difference between a black hole and a translation exercise. In a black hole, you're operating outside the law. In a translation exercise, you may debate whether the translation is correct. But there is no doubt that we're operating within the framework of the law, not denying application of the law altogether. What I want to argue today very quickly is that in these particular areas, a body of law has emerged, uh, which is transnationally shared with other developed nations, particularly our European colleagues. Now, let me start with the basic question, which is, is the Obama administration's approach the same as the Bush administration's approach? This is a simplistic idea sometimes set forward by uh, media. Let me suggest six ways in which there are crucial differences. First, that this administration does not speak of a global war on terror, but the notion that there are military operations outside of hot battlefields against terrorist networks that are constrained by international law principles of state sovereignty. Secondly, under domestic law, that we do not operate on unenumerated constitutional powers of the president alone, but on congressional authorizations plus constitutional power. That as a matter of international law, these domestic authorizations are informed by the laws of war, although there are those in even the DC circuit who disagree. That we do not use an either or approach, is this war or law enforcement, but that we combine them into a hybrid paradigm. So what may be appropriate for an ISIL leader in Syria may change from a war approach there to a law enforcement approach if that ISIL leader is found in, say, Brussels. Uh, fifth, that we do not simply operate based on labels. Calling someone an enemy combatant doesn't, doesn't suddenly say that anything against that person goes. Instead, it is a fact-based inquiry, as the deputy mayor said, about who the individuals are who are being subjects of military action. And finally, an absolute commitment to humane treatment, both in detention and interrogation. These are important differences, and they fit into what I would say is a broader Obama administration legal theory of an integrated targeting and detention approach as part of a general strategy of smart power. You've heard this from this administration repeatedly, particularly Secretary Clinton. A notion that targeting should be lawful, detention should be both legally authorized and done under lawful conditions with the fruits of, the, of uh, illegal detention not being used in subsequent proceedings, and lawful cooperation with other states who are also at war and relying on law enforcement authorities. And I know that uh, my colleague from Eurojust will say more about this in the discussion session. So where do these legal rules come from? Three sources, international criminal law, as it's developed since Nuremberg, particularly now in the International Criminal Court Rome Statute, which addresses genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and after 2017, the crime of aggression. The laws of armed conflict, sometimes known as international humanitarian law, and international human rights law when it is not ousted by uh, other bodies of law as a controlling lex specialis. 
What does it mean to be in an armed conflict? We're in an armed conflict when we're fighting with an organized armed group which have a particular nature, intensity, and scope. And that armed conflict can either be an international armed conflict or a non-international armed conflict as declared by either the state itself or by the International Committee of the Red Cross. We're very familiar with two kinds of armed conflict, US versus Germany, an international armed conflict in World War II, a non-international armed conflict of the type we saw in Colombia, the government versus the FARC, a civil conflict. But what we've seen is the emergence of another kind of non-international armed conflict between a nation state and a transnational terrorist network. And it was Justice Breyer, among others, who in the Hamdan case in 2006 identified the conflict with al-Qaeda as this kind of non-international armed conflict. We are in a war not with terror, but with al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces. This administration has construed ISIL or Daesh as part of these associated forces, the key being that they be co-belligerents in the sense of having entered the fight against the United States alongside other armed groups. And the hot battlegrounds, active theaters, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, Russia says it has been invited there by Assad. The United States is participating there against ISIL. What law must the US follow? Well, under traditional laws of war, the law of initiating war, jus ad bellum, and the law during wartime, jus in bello, under domestic law following the Constitution and the authorizations for use of military force. Which brings us to what has been the position of the US government since the second half of the Bush administration. The United States is in a non-international armed conflict with al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and associated forces in response to the 9-11 attacks and subsequent attacks and may use force consistent with the laws of war and its inherent right to self-defense under international law, and that the Congress has authorized appropriate and necessary uses of force through statute in response. Now, this raises several issues. What constitutes a valid armed conflict? When are you acting in individual or collective self-defense? And when has the state in which the action occurs consented to the use of force on its territory or demonstrated itself to be unwilling or unable to suppress the threat? The classic example here being uh, the raid on Osama bin Laden. In conflict, the conduct of force is governed by well-established rules, distinction between civilians and military, necessity, proportionality in the use of force, and rules of humanity. So when you hear people talk about carpet bombing, it's illegal. Um, now, I heard recently this candidate mention the notion of selective carpet bombing, which is an <laughs> oxymoron if I've ever heard of it. But to go on, under the Geneva Conventions, the four Geneva Conventions, common article three, the rule of humanity says, there shall be no violence to life and persons, including torture, no taking of hostages, no outrages on personal dignity, no sentences without due process. And the additional protocol one, which the US has treated as customary international law, amplifies these guarantees and outlaws all forms of violence uh, against uh, those persons who are non-combatants. Now, it does not matter that al-Qaeda has not signed the torture conventions or the Geneva Conventions. Uh, I recall a meeting I had with a senator who said to me, Professor, oh, by the way, inside the Beltway, Professor is not a term of respect. <laughs> he said, Professor, the last time I checked, al-Qaeda hasn't signed the torture convention or the Geneva Convention. And I said, Senator, last time I checked, the whales hadn't signed the whaling convention either. <laughs> this is not about contract. Uh, it's not about a bilateral agreement. It's about what are minimal standards of humane treatment. Or as Senator McCain put it well, it's not about them and who they are, but about us and who we are. And it contains the notion in additional protocol two, which the US has respected on the key 
provisions, no acts or threats of violence, the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among the civilian population, including such banal threats as making the sand glow. Now, <clears throat> you will hear some say we should proceed to waterboarding or a hell of a lot worse than waterboarding. Uh, the short answer, which you saw in the retraction, which came from this candidate's campaign, is uh, unfortunately that's illegal. And if the president has taken an oath to uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States, that's probably an impeachable offense. Because the torture convention says uh, justification may not be justified by a state of war or a threat of war, and that all acts of torture, wherever they can uh, occur, must be criminalized. Senator McCain made the policy point as well. These statements mislead Americans about the realities of interrogation. I would urge you to read Shane O'Mara's book, Why Torture Doesn't Work. He's a professor of brain research, experimental brain research at the University of Dublin. His point is very simple. At a cellular neurological level, it does the opposite of what it is intended to do, so it is a pointless act. Or as Orwell say, would say, the only point of torture is torture. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then this brings us to The Hague. The International Court of Justice has said that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights does not cease in times of war if there has not been a derogation. In the Palestinian wall case, that the court must take account of both international human rights law and international humanitarian law. And so we apply a provision by provision approach. There are some human rights provisions which may be impracticable in time of war, for example, elections, but others like the right to be free of torture and cruel treatment are non-derogable and cannot be relaxed. Charlie Savage of the New York Times in his new book, Power Wars, recounts a debate in which I was involved. I left behind when I left the State Department on my last day as legal advisor a memo which said I did not believe that it was legally available for policymakers to claim that the torture convention did not apply outside the United States. And in 2015, this administration made explicit the Assistant Secretary for Human Rights, Tom Malinowski, the torture ban applies in all places at all times with no exceptions. And then my successor as legal advisor, Mary McLeod, echoed the same notion. So that is the law of interrogation. What about detention? Increasingly, as the president made clear in his National Archives speech seven years ago, civilian trials are preferred. Military commissions must comply with the Constitution. Transfer of detainees from Guantanamo continues. And as of yesterday, they report that of the 91 left, 17 will soon depart, hoping to leave that number at something like 45 by the end of the summer still with time to go, an executive order on periodic review, and now embodied in the National Defense Authorization Act, an absolute statutory guarantee of humane treatment. Now, I'm often asked, you are a human rights lawyer. How can you defend drones? And the answer is quite simple. All torture is illegal. The president cannot be torture in chief. This is an absolute ban in all circumstances. But ironically, killing in warfare can be lawful if it's done according to the laws of war. You may not like it, but if you're a lawyer in the government, it is your inescapable duty, it is your duty, to draw the line between uses of force that are or are not lawful. And if we are indeed in an armed conflict, we can engage in certain kinds of lawful lethal warfare. For example, targeted killing can be lawful when conducted against someone not in government custody as self-defense or as part of an armed conflict if that person has no immunity under the Geneva Conventions and can indeed, as President Aaron Barak of the Israeli Supreme Court suggested, be more consistent with human rights norms because of the lower possibility of collateral damage. What makes targeted killing lawful is that the action is authorized, that the person targeted's rights have been adequately considered, and that the rights of the sovereignty of the country have been adequately respected. 
If done correctly, it is not extrajudicial killing, it is not summary execution, it is not assassination, and it can be carried out by special operations, as in the case of bin Laden, or by drone. Which means that drones may be lawfully used for targeted operations. There are some weapons that are inherently illegal in my judgment, chemical weapons, anti-personnel landmines, unexploded ordnance, cluster bombs, but not drones. How they are used determines whether or not they are lawful. So take this thought experiment. Suppose that after Congress had authorized the use of military force, if the president, who had been the person at the time who had won the popular vote, had come out and said the following. Yesterday, or a week ago, we were attacked. 3,000 innocent people were killed for going to work. We will have to respond. Here is what I will not do. I will not torture anyone. I will not open Guantanamo. I will not invade Iraq. I will not conduct con kidnappings or extraordinary rendition. I will not violate people's rights by surveillance. I will cooperate with our allies in a transparent uh, fashion. But if the only place I can find bin Laden and his supporters is in a cave in Tora Bora, and the only way I can reach them is by drone, I will use that lawful method. Please support me. Now, but a lot of water under the dam since that speech was not made. But what it tells you is that it's not the drones that are illegal. It is the way in which other things have been conducted that have carried or put a cloud over so much of what U.S. has done since 2001. Now, President Obama, upon taking office, made clear that his goal was to obey law, even in times of armed conflict. He said this at his archive speech and again in his Nobel Prize speech. At the National Defense University in May 2013, he emphasized that a smart power approach can include drones as an effective discriminant tool to help dismantle specific networks that threaten the United States. And he made clear his preference for capture over kill, respect for state sovereignty, the notion that self-defense can include the notion of continuing imminent threat or elongated imminence against someone who clearly is determined to strike against senior operational leaders so long there is a near certainty of no civilian presence. Now, these are policy rules. They're in presidential policy guidance. I would hope that they could be embodied into executive order. But to my mind, these rules are consistent with the laws of war. And if you translate them into codes of conduct and internalize them through private contracts, they can even govern private security contractors, as has been done in something called the Montreux document. What about robots? The law of war does not yet treat autonomous robots as a per se illegal instrument. Semi-autonomous robots have human beings in the loop and can be programmed to operate under the same set of principles, or the operators can use the same set of principles as in the NDU speech. And it's very clear that fully autonomous robots, which engage targets independent of human interference or supervision, think Arnold Schwarzenegger in The Terminator, not as governor of California. <laughs> fully autonomous robots obviously uh, probably enter the zone of per se illegal weapons. What about cyber intrusions? This is a difficult area we will discuss further. We need to distinguish between cyber monitoring, defense and espionage, hacking, which can be done by private parties, network exploitation, which is a form of intelligence, and network attack, which can have broader physical consequences. For example, using a computer to open a dam Shutting down a hospital is no different than bombing the dam or bombing the hospital. In 2012, at Cyber Command, I gave a speech called The Ten Rules of Cyber Conflict, which made clear that international law applies in cyberspace. It is not a law-free zone or black hole. It can be used of force, and the laws of use in bellum and use in bellow apply. 
with states being responsible for the actions of proxy actors. And a series of legal experts in an exercise called the Tallinn Manual have elaborated this. To further legalize cyber conflict, we need to translate the laws of war to make it even clearer that cyberspace is not law-free zones, to incorporate government standard-setting exercises into other exercises, and to promulgate these through diplomatic negotiation before <laughs> forums like the group of governmental experts. Finally, we end with Syria, a tragic story that you all know, the civil war, the violations in armed conflict, the migrant crisis, the border closings, the discrimination against uh, those who are feared to be ISIL, 250,000 plus dead, 7 million displaced, 5 million refugees, uh, 2 million of those children, like this poor infant. President Obama suggested that the approach here, and this is his very last State of the Union speech a few weeks ago, is a smart power approach to conflicts like Syria. One of the issues being raised over and over is whether it is lawful to enter Syrian territory. Raised earlier in the administration, is it lawful to give humanitarian assistance? Later, is it lawful to support Syrian rebels? Now, one of the questions, as Aleppo remains divided and as uh, uh, refugees flock to the border between Aleppo and Turkey, is, is it possible to give them some sort of humanitarian protection? Here, some claim that the UN Charter, Article 2.4, is absolute, that it is a violation of sovereignty to enter. I think it is a moment to question this, as we did in Kosovo itself. If this were true, any member of the Permanent Five could commit genocide against its own citizens, veto all Security Council resolutions, and no one could do anything about it, and maybe somebody can explain to me how that is consistent with the values of the UN, including human rights. Some have called humanitarian intervention illegal but legitimate. I consider this a cop-out. As a Canadian commission headed by Lord Axworthy pointed out, if the Security Council fails to discharge its responsibilities, concerned states will not rule out other means and forms of action. In his Nobel lecture, President Obama made clear that he believed that use of force for humanitarian grounds, as in the Balkans, can be justified. It's not clear the fact that it's lawful means that it must always be done. And he clearly has concluded differently with regard to Syria. But I do think we need to question the notion of illegal but legitimate as the ending point. Did we say that same-sex marriage is illegal but legitimate? Or did we move to make it lawful? It seems clear to me that in the black letter realm, the rules that claim to be absolutist, recalling to my mind more an approach I associate with the late Justice Scalia than with Justice Breyer, creates an intolerable bias toward inaction in the face of gross abuses. Isn't there a time to define a narrow responsibility to protect in the name of human rights? I have an article coming out which suggests this particular test, that when you have disruptive consequences likely lead to imminent threats to peace and security, other remedies have been exhausted, the humanitarian use of force is limited, necessary, and proportionate. If action is done collectively, as NATO did in Kosovo, to prevent illegal means like chemical weapons to be used for illegal ends like war crimes, the use of force in these circumstances is legally justified. And you can analogize it to the Good Samaritan principle in tort law. Tort law rarely preauthorizes people to use force, but if they do, they hold them exempt from wrongfulness after the fact. You recognize the tension with the letter of the law, but you invoke an affirmative defense. And I might ask whether it isn't the task of international lawyers to develop the law in this area in service of human dignity. A final point, the looming crime of aggression which will be activated in 2017. I cite you here to an article that was just published in the American Journal of International Law. If Western leaders in NATO, for example, engage in humanitarian intervention in a place like Kosovo, can they be charged with aggression at the International Criminal Court? 
And if that were done, wouldn't that deter human rights action? And isn't it perverse, perverse, to say that the only remedy that people have for crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide is episodic, after-the-fact punishment, and that there is no remedy of prevention, and any effort to undertake the prevention will be criminalized. This cannot be the law. Lawyers can figure out a better solution. So in closing, let me say what I believe is the lessons of this. In today's armed conflict, the laws are not silent. Even though the means are mutating, there is a emerging 21st century law of war. It doesn't follow verbatim from 20th century law, but it is a good faith effort not to have a black hole, but to translate the spirit of those laws to the present day. These laws govern interrogation, detention, drones, special operations, private security council contractors, and the responsibility to protect. Our challenge going forward is how to clarify these rules, make them more legal, more transparent, and more subject to external oversight. Or if you just need to remember this lecture in one phrase, we do not have to apply the Turner Doctrine. Tina Turner, that is. You know the song, what's law got to do with it? What's law but a sweet old-fashioned notion? <laughs> that is not true in this area. The laws of war do not fall silent simply because conflict is evolving. We have a great deal of emerging law to develop, apply, codify, and enforce, and that is what I call the translated law of 21st century war. This is my tribute to Brookings, to Strobe, to Justice Breyer, to the City of The Hague, and to global justice. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this panel discussion on the emerging law of 21st century war. The panel provides us with an opportunity to delve deeper into the substantive issues uh, which um, Professor Koh has outlined uh, in this year's Briar Lecture. It is a great pleasure to be back at Brookings and for the Higg Institute to partner with Brookings and the Netherlands foreign ministry, particularly the Dutch embassy here in Washington, and of course the city of The Hague to host the third annual Justice Stephen Breyer Lecture on International Law. And I thank uh, Professor Coe very much for his stimulating and thought-provoking lecture. We hope through this series to shed light on pressing questions of international law and to elucidate the work of the Hague-based institutions in the process. There is little dispute that the means and methods of waging war have changed significantly in the decades since the laws governing the conduct of modern warfare were drafted. The nature of armed conflict has also changed significantly since the Geneva Conventions of 1949 and their additional protocols were drafted, modern warfare is increasingly asymmetrical and spreads easily across national borders. States, even those that are allies, have different understandings of how to interpret and apply the laws of war to new means and methods of warfare, sometimes within the same theater of operation. So a shared understanding of the emerging laws of war in the 21st century is therefore imperative in order to facilitate more effective and coherent responses to the multiple crises that threaten global security. 
We are fortunate, therefore, to have with us this morning two distinguished panelists who will discuss the emerging laws of war and the challenges of compliance. Our keynote speaker, Harold Coe, who is the Sterling Professor of International Law at Yale mm. Law School, and the president of uh, Eurojust, Michelle Cummings. I will begin by posing a series of questions to our panelists, and after approximately 35 minutes or so, I will open up the discussion uh, to the audience. So let me begin uh, with Harold uh, Coe, if I may. While there is broad agreement between uh, the US and EU as to the importance of a rules-based approach to warfare, are there significant differences in how these actors interpret key elements of international humanitarian law? And can differences among allies in interpreting the laws of war undermine the possibility of complementary, coordinated, and ultimately uh, effective action? Um, so first of all, I think that there is widespread agreement. Um, uh, the agreements far outweigh the disagreements, and uh, will probably continue to do so uh, as this uh, whole exercise is increasingly becoming active in, in Europe, um, which, by the way, I think lends itself to the notion of greater collective standard setting. Uh, it's high time for an agreed statement of principles. It's high time for public discussion of these shared principles. What I think um, are the two main points of disagreement uh, that have emerged is on what happens when a state has not explicitly consented to a military action on its soil. To what extent can you invoke the notion of unwilling or unable as a proxy for state consent? So for example, if you have a country which knows that uh, a NATO legal action will take place on its soil, they will not protest, but neither will they come out and explicitly say, uh, we agree. At what point uh, is that unable or unwilling approach sufficient to give the state consent necessary to overcome state sovereignty? We see this uh, lack of clarity in Syria. We're in an absurd situation where Assad has consented for the Russians to participate. Assad is silent on the US using force against ISIL. But Assad will not consent for the US to provide assistance inside Syria. So the notion of state consent in one circumstance has been overcome, and, and at the exact same time, with regard to the thing of most per pressing humanitarian need, is being treated as if it's a somehow absolute consideration. The other main difference is about self-defense. Uh, people point out, correctly I think, that the original notion of self-defense is against an imminent attack. And if you have lots of imminent attacks, you should be in a state of armed conflict, not in a repeat state of self-defense. But what has become clear over time is that when there are groups that are constantly planning attacks, you don't have to wait till the next attack is about to be implemented to act against them. So for example, um, if Al Qaeda acts against the United States by airplanes into towers, um, cartridge, printer cartridge bombs, shoe bombs, um, underwear bombs, the last mode of delivery will change, which means that you must be able to have some ability to respond in self-defense before that penultimate moment. Now, the question is, how far back can you go before the notion of imminent self-defense is lost and becomes preemptive self-defense? And the notion that the administration has used in its own presidential policy guidance is continuing an imminent threat. And that is based on the notion that there are a group of individuals, hopefully a small group, who do nothing but plan attacks. And so each attack is a continuation of the previous one. That's different from declaring the place where those attacks are occurring theaters of armed conflict. You know, you don't declare Brussels the theater of armed conflict because there was an attack there. 
In fact, that can be addressed through law enforcement and uh, is being addressed that way now. Well, let's turn to, to Brussels, um, uh, Michelle Connings. Eurojust seeks to improve cooperation and coordination amongst member states to facilitate investigation and prosecution of cross-border crimes, including terrorism. In light of the recent attacks in Brussels, what are the uh, challenges of compliance with international regimes when multiple states are involved? When we talk about terrorist attacks, we talk about um, attacks which are planned, plotted, organized uh, um, across the borders of different states. Uh, this uh, was shown in the Paris attacks uh, last year, and the Brussels attacks, and it will not change. This is uh, a given fact. Uh, that means that it's self-evident that we have uh, to strive for, um, as has been said uh, by Mrs. Uh, Engelshofer, for national coordination, cooperation, and international cooperation. These are the key words. Uh, stick together, uh, join the forces, uh, have a common objective in fighting uh, uh, terrorists. Uh, Eurojust uh, is the agency which is involved in international judicial cooperation and uh, coordination. So it's at the heart of our activities to bring judicial and law enforcement authorities together around terrorism and criminal ma networks. In tackling terrorism, however, we are confronted with national criminal laws uh, and international uh, uh, laws, conventions, uh, treaties, uh, uh, and hence it's becoming more and more complex. Uh, if you, for instance, uh, want uh, to prosecute or not to prosecute a terrorist, you might uh, um, hit questions uh, around uh, international criminal law uh, or international human rights uh, law. So it is extremely important uh, to have um, a reflection and analysis on an ad hoc basis. And this is exactly what we do for every and every single terrorist attack we are coordinating or where we are ensuring judicial uh, cooperation. Now, the European Union has always uh, favoured the criminal justice approach, uh, and that uh, um, uh, coincided with the existence of Eurojust. We started uh, to uh, see the daylight in 2001, 2002, coincided with the 9-11 attacks. And we have since then uh, been facing different terrorist attacks. The Madrid bombings, 2004, the London bombings, 2005. Uh, we had uh, foreign terrorist fighters uh, network in 2005 uh, um, being um, disrupted uh, by the Belgian authorities in 2005 in close cooperation with the United States. Uh, and it continued. Uh, continued till uh, 2014 with uh, the attack against uh, the Jewish Museum and of course 2015 which was a year uh, of a lot of dramas and ending up by the last uh, attacks. But we have seen that all along the line in European law uh, we have been confronted with a framework uh, uh, decision uh, in 2002 which uh, was um, meant to define for the first time in history uh, what is terrorism at the EU uh, level. And it continued in 2008, where recruitment uh, uh, and uh, training and public provocation were being um, um, penalized. Uh, and recently, we have also adopted the UN uh, resolution and uh, 2178 and the uh, second additional pro protocol to the um, Convention of Prevention of Terrorism into an initiative taken by the Commission on a directive. How can we tackle uh, foreign terrorist fighters? What about traveling for terrorist purposes? What about uh, the financing of the traveling and the organization of travel of the foreign terrorist fighters? Um, what about um, passive training? These are uh, to be taken into account now under the initiative uh, of the Commission. So we see that from 2001, we have not left any occasion aside uh, to streamline uh, the um, legal frame at EU level, always based on the criminal justice uh, um, um, uh, approach, and we will continue to do so. We will gradually, at EU just uh, follow up uh, on the impacts uh, of those uh, changes, because what has been regulated uh, through directive and in decisions have to be implemented in the national laws of the member state, and that has been gradually done 
and throughout uh, the uh, uh, analysis of convictions, which is uh, monitored by UHS, we see what is the impact uh, uh, of uh, the uh, implemented uh, laws, uh, in what extent uh, uh, international humanitarian law, a uh, complex uh, with uh, terrorism uh, laws, uh, what has been adopted and accepted uh, by uh, the judges, what has been accepted uh, to be terrorist uh, uh, activity translated into terrorist offences, or what is and has to be translated into international humanitarian law. So we follow up uh, strictly through what we call the terrorism convictions monitor, but I will give some more insight the later yeah. on. There has been uh, a lot of uh, criticism about um, uh, the Belgian authorities and uh, the performance in light of these attacks. You have a unique perspective, both as president of Eurojust and as a former Belgian prosecutor. Do you think these uh, criticisms are justified? I think we have to be, after each and every single terrorist attack, to be critical, uh, to ensure that uh, what uh, was not going well uh, will not be repeated uh, by other uh, future and potential uh, victims, uh, but when it's uh, criticism for the criticism, not based on any uh, in-depth knowledge of the reality, not based on the true and correct information, uh, it's uh, uh, destructive and then it's unacceptable. It will divert the attention of policymakers, politicians, to what they really have to do, and that's to focus on the thing right now. Uh, I know, and I'm still a Belgian federal prosecutor, uh, that uh, we managed uh, in uh, 2015, in January, uh, to abort uh, a terrorist attack in Verviers on the 15th of uh, January. I know that in July 2015, um, Abawit, for instance, and uh, Reda Cricket, the names you certainly have heard about uh, through the newspapers, were being convicted uh, by a Brussels tribunal. Um, they were subject of uh, international um, uh, arrest warrants in the meantime. Um, I know that a lot of uh, attacks have been aborted, but the problem we're faced with now of foreign terrorist fighters is an immense complex problem. A problem. Uh, it is uh, not about a well-structured terrorist group uh, which is operating from a specific uh, um, uh, territory. It is about uh, uh, isolated, uh, lone uh, uh, persons and wolves, uh, terrorists. It's about uh, the loose groups uh, which sometimes do not move at all and which are incited and invited to act in a terrorist way through the internet. Uh, not easy to detect. In other terms, uh, we have to be lucky at all times. They have to be lucky only once. Uh, we have been, and not only in Belgium, but in a lot of European states uh, being capable, able to disrupt. Think about the French recent action uh, um, uh, in um, the last uh, uh, weeks. Uh, we have been able to disrupt terrorist activity, uh, but we might not be lucky at all times because of the way the modus operandi of the foreign terrorist fighters. We cannot focus only on those going back and forth to Syria and coming back, focus on the returnees would be not a wise thing. We cannot uh, uh, focus uh, on um, structured groups. We cannot focus on people uh, uh, who have only a criminal record for terrorism. We have to focus on a lot of things at the same time. So it's crucial, again, to have a multidisciplinary approach in a state and across uh, the states. This is not easy. We're learning from each and every single attack uh, uh, and spreading the good news to best practices. This is also one of the um, tasks of Eurojust. Uh, we have been started working on foreign terrorist fighters since 2012 when we first were informed about the Sherry for Belgium movements uh, in Belgium. And we have since then not left any moment opportunity to continuously work on the approaches of the 28 different member states in facing foreign terrorist fighters. Will we always be successful? No. Is this to be criticized? No. The answer is judicial cooperation, law enforcement cooperation, coordination within the European Union and with other partners, including and especially with the United States. Uh, Abby, uh, yeah. Michelle makes a very important point that shouldn't be lost. Um, there's a myth um, operating out there that um, 
the Europeans favor a law enforcement approach and that the Americans favor a war approach. In fact, that is not the dichotomy. So, for example, the Boston Marathon bombing was handled by law enforcement. The Belgian situation is handled by law enforcement. The French situation is being handled by law enforcement. Nobody argues that that ought to be dealt with by military action. So, for example, um, but it goes to the point about a state that's able and willing. A former presidential candidate, now out of the race, said things like, under the administration's rules, you can use a drone against someone sitting in a cafe in New York. That's obviously not so. That person can be detained by law enforcement process. So why would you ever import a war paradigm into that situation? So the exact same person, as you noticed, when after the Belgian uh, attacks, Secretary Carter, Ash Carter, announced that there had been a drone attack on a senior leader in a place that was inaccessible by other means, where at the same time, law enforcement action is occurring in Europe. And these things go together. Um, it's a combined paradigm. It's not either or. Well, Harold, you served, as we, we know, as legal advisor to the State Department dealing with issues including the detention of uh, enemy combatants and drone warfare. Is it ever the case that <coughs> compliance with international law is at odds with the formulation of an effective domestic security policy? Well, first of all, I should acknowledge in the audience we have a legal advisor of the State Department, Brian Egan, uh, who is, uh, I'm touched that he is here. His counselor, uh, Catherine Amrafar, is also here. He's giving a major speech uh, tonight at the American Society of International Law, which is more important than this speech. <laughs> uh, and I encourage you to attend. Um, it is the job of the legal advisor of the State Department to uh, ensure that we're living up to our international legal commitments uh, without threatening our security situation. So we certainly believe that these things can be reconciled, and we work very closely with the Justice Department. I know that Michelle works very closely with uh, Attorney General Lynch and senior officials of the Justice Department on international criminal action. Um, and so these things have all developed over time. Um, it's a multi-pronged philosophy. The State Department has a counterterrorism uh, office that specializes in counterterrorism diplomacy. So the, in a multifaceted problem, you don't just use one tool. You use many, many tools. And if there's a point of my presentation, it's that these different tools should be targeted to the things to which they are both most effective and can be most clearly conducted in a legal fashion. And uh, Michelle, you've mentioned um, foreign fighters, and Eurojust assists member states with the investigation and prosecution of foreign fighters in the EU, but it has also highlighted that member states may encounter difficulties um, when prosecuting foreign fighters due to the complexity of qualifying their actions as breaches of international humanitarian law. How do you think those difficulties can be overcome? Well, we have seen um, lately clear messages from the tribunals uh, that uh, in every single case of a terrorist um, um, uh, trial, uh, the uh, message of the tribunals have been, uh, uh, it is not international humanitarian law, it is uh, terrorist uh, uh, activity that should be translated into terrorist offences and being judged and convicted uh, as such. Uh, and one of the cases I would like to refer to is the emblematic uh, Sharif for Belgium um, uh, conviction that took place um, in February last year, the 11th of February 2015. There's an appeal in January this year confirming the um, first instance uh, uh, conviction uh, where defense uh, uh, lawyers, and there were 46 uh, defendants, uh, were pleading uh, for um, the uh, application of the international humanitarian uh, law, um, um, referring to the conflicts uh, in uh, Syria uh, as a non-international uh, uh, conflict, uh, armed conflict, uh, uh, referring to the um, uh, fact that uh, the um, um, 
defendants uh, were linked to that uh, um, um, armed uh, conflict uh, and that the terrorism uh, law was not applicable. And they made reference uh, to the so-called Article 141 bis of the Criminal Code, uh, which is making the exception. This is not terrorism, this is international humanitarian law. Uh, why um, uh, was this being um, uh, corrected by uh, uh, the judge? Uh, they uh, said that it was between uh, the defendants and uh, Shabbat al-Nusra, no reason to say that uh, Shabbat al-Nusra was uh, um, having its activity in the frame uh, of the uh, non-international armed uh, conflict, uh, uh, that they were not to be considered uh, as uh, uh, armed uh, groups or troops uh, seen in an armed conflict during the period of an armed uh, conflict, uh, that uh, they had not the same characteristics uh, uh, and that their activity had to be seen as pure terrorist uh, activity. And that reasoning has been um, um, uh, applied by uh, recent uh, convictions uh, in the Netherlands in 2013, 14, and 15 uh, for different uh, um, um, uh, terrorist uh, activities, which uh, were being labelled by the defendants uh, as international humanitarian law uh, activities, and which were seen as pure terrorist uh, uh, activities. Uh, now, we uh, are monitoring very closely all these uh, convictions, uh, have fine-tuned analyses of these uh, uh, convictions and do uh, share them with all the anti-terrorism prosecutors uh, of the European Union uh, in order to inspire uh, the prosecutors uh, who do go to court uh, uh, in order to inspire uh, their um, 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 uh, time, uh, the judges. Uh, uh, that what is happening uh, in Syria uh, when it's done uh, uh, to um, establish a caliphate, uh, to establish an Islamic state, is not to be seen as an armed activity in an armed uh, conflict, uh, is to be seen as uh, terrorism legislation. Um, this uh, is being ruled also by the European uh, Union in its recital uh, 11 of the framework decision of 2002. Uh, it's explicitly, explicitly foresee this uh, exception that some of the activity is not to be seen as terrorism activity in certain circumstances and that this exception has to be included in the national laws. Well, we have uh, made reference to these exceptional uh, um, um, uh, circumstances, but the judges believe at all times uh, the reasoning of the prosecutors. So it is on an ad hoc basis being discussed in courts. Uh, so far, the messages of the tribunals are very clear, not in line with the Indian international humanitarian law, uh, but uh, in uh, application uh, of the national and international um, terrorism uh, law. Okay. Um, Harold, you mentioned um, the responsibility to protect, which was adopted at the World Summit at the UN 10 years ago with a lot of hope and expectation. Uh, R2P was invoked for the intervention in Libya, but of course has now been facing serious uh, difficulties, particularly within the Security Council, with divergent views on RTP among the permanent members. Two questions. First, do you think there was a basis for invoking RTP for action in Syria, which was missed? And second, is there anything that can be done to bridge the differences now within the Security Council regarding the responsibility to protect? Um. So, so first of all, as lawyers, we talk about whether the option is available, whether it's lawful when there is no Security Council resolution to take action under certain circumstances to prevent great humanitarian suffering. Whether it's available is different from whether and when you ought to use it. It just means that the lawyers are not taking the policy option <laughs> off the table. I, I really want to make this point very explicit. Now, the question, if one country is going to veto every single resolution, do we really believe that the Russians or any other country in the P5 could commit genocide against their own citizens and veto all resolutions and the whole world can do nothing forever? I mean, if, if this is true, Assad could gas every child in Syria tomorrow and hide behind a Russian veto. And the international law in the name of sovereignty supposedly permits this to happen. 
This is not a pro-peace position. It's a pro-slaughter position. More than that, and we ought to emphasize this, it's not a non-intervention position when everybody else has already intervened in Syria. Now, was there a moment? The issue came up, or has come up in a number of respects. First, could you give humanitarian assistance uh, to groups inside of Syria, or is that a violation of international law? Secondly, could you arm certain rebel groups to act inside Syria? And a third possibility, could you enter Syrian sovereignty for the purpose of creating a humanitarian zone? Not that many people are calling for that at the moment, although some presidential candidates are. And finally, could you enter for the purpose of preventing the mass use of chemical weapons? It seems to me that that option is not taken off the table by lawyers. And people who say that the law is absolutely crystal clear have not addressed the changes in the law that you describe. And as I said, the notion that this is illegal but legitimate strikes me as a cop-out. Uh, if, if you have something you believe to be legitimate, like same-sex marriage, you take the necessary steps to make it lawful. And the notion of a Good Samaritan principle is if someone does it, even if they weren't authorized to do it ahead of time, they shouldn't be punished for it by being prosecuted as an international crime. I mean, how can it be that someone intervenes to prevent genocide and then they're accused of committing aggression? That makes absolutely no sense. So international law, there's a claim of a clarity, absolutist clarity of black letter rule that has been up for grabs for many, many years, and that's what you described. We just have to acknowledge the reality, which is let's not fall back to black and white when the reality is very gray. Yeah. You said that uh, lawyers, international lawyers, focus on whether an option is available to policymakers, and if policymakers choose to use that option, that's another question. There's a legal option, which of course is in the, the veto. Uh, and the right to veto uh, under the Charter, which the P5 have. There is now a proposal and a move to get members in the UN to sign up to abstaining from the use, uh, to encourage the P5 to abstain from the use of the veto in issues of mass atrocities. Now, do you think um, that should be the way forward to make sure that the veto does not apply and is not an option when mass atrocities are being committed? Well, it'd be great. Um, the P5, certain members simply will not forsake the veto, even if every other country in the world says that they shouldn't veto. I mean, we had the astonishing spectacle of Vladimir Putin attacking the US in the fall of 2013 for not respecting sovereignty in Syria by threatening an attack with regard to chemical weapons when he himself had just invaded Ukraine. I mean, that is the height of hypocrisy that we should not clothe in legal protection because it's just not true. Now, um, let, let me go back to a famous historic example. Um, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, people presented the option, uh, a false set of options, ground invasion, do nothing, or unilateral strike. And uh, the lawyers look to the notion of an interdiction or a quarantine. And some people argued that it was an illegal blockade, um, as it was. In fact, most academic international lawyers criticized that fourth option. Now, 50 years later, this is considered a decision-making exercise in progressive development of legal arguments that is consistent with better policy. So the law and policy evolve in this area. That's, if there's a message that I'm trying to convey here, we know a difference between a flatly illegal option and one which is uh, lawful and should be made legally available. And, and finally, and I think this is a very important point, um, the absolutist rule creates a institutional bias toward inaction and passivity that is not mandated by the rule itself. After all, the, the purposes of the UN are to protect human rights. So how can it be that sovereignty becomes the number one value in the interpretation of Article 
it, it is not true to what the organization represents in this day and age. If that were so, Kosovo would have been illegal. If that were so, acting in Rwanda would have been illegal. If that were so, stepping in tomorrow, if there was broad-scale genocide, anywhere in the world protected by a veto would be illegal. Well, I'd like to invite members of the audience now to pose questions to the panelists. I'll take questions uh, in sets of three and ask that you state your name and give your uh, affiliation. And do keep your questions brief so we can get in as many as possible. There's a roving mic. Let's start with the lady in front. Thank you. My name is Diane Vavracek. I'm from the Center for Naval Analyses. And I have a question for Professor Ko. Um, appreciate your, your uh, talk very much. And I was wondering what you think the most important things um, the American military should be doing right now in line with what you spoke about would be. Okay. The gentleman at the back. Uh, thank you. Peter Shutley, retired State Department. In the 19th and 20th century, military aggression was easy to spot. Armies moved across borders. My question to you is, what should be the threshold for cyber aggression? Okay, good. And the gentleman. Um, thank you for a very good presentation. I'm Elliot Hurwitz. I'm a former uh, State Department, uh, World Bank, and Intelligence Community person. Um, I remember vividly after 9-11, uh, as a contractor in the World Bank, um, watching the actions of the George H.W. Bush administration. I'd like to ask Professor Koh about whether he believes that the actions of the George H.W. Bush administration post 9-11. George W. Bush. George W. Bush, sorry, made a mistake, um, were legal or illegal. Thank you very much. Good. Uh -huh. Well, first of all, there are several different questions. I, I think the U.S. military is a critically important in terms of its internalization of the Geneva Conventions. I do not believe that the U.S. military would obey an order from a civilian co commander to torture somebody in violation of the Geneva Conventions because they have internalized those rules. And I think you heard some of that which actually forced one of the presidential candidates to recant his position uh, and to fall back to saying he would do whatever was lawful or something like that. Although every time he goes on TV, he recants the recantation. The second point, I think, makes the point very graphically. Um, let me put it this way. If, if I'm on my computer in Washington and I'm monitoring what's going on in a computer abroad, that's cyber monitoring. It might even be cyber espionage, and it might be authorized by covert action laws. Um, if uh, we determine, because the networks that are operating are illegal, that we can copy their files, that suddenly becomes computer network exploitation. But if you determine that somebody is about to use the, the foreign computer system to destroy a dam or a hospital in the United States, you can block it electronically. And if you determine at a certain point that this is the widespread offensive intent of the foreign government, let's say the Sony hack or something, you may be in a situation in which you do a very broad scale immobilization of somebody's system. All of this happens within a split second. And um, it may be an electronic response to something being detected in the process of what began as simply a surveillance. That's what makes it so difficult. You know, in the old days, someone offensively moved troops across a border. It takes three or four days. That's obviously aggression. Nowadays, it can happen in less than a blink of an eye, and you really don't know. Um, now, let's be frank about this. There are countries with huge cyber capabilities, huge Asian countries with huge cyber capabilities, 
Who would love, therefore, for this to be a law-free zone? Because then they could do what they can, in Thucydides' phrase, and the weak suffer what they must. The group of governmental experts made a different decision in response to US and uh, European support, which is that this should be a zone in which legal rules are clarified on exactly this kind of question. And the most difficult question being, what if somebody uses a proxy actor to act instead of acting directly? In other words, it's not a governmental computer that does it, but it's been farmed out to somebody else. Uh, to my former uh, State Department colleague, I've identified many ways in which I believe that the George W. Bush administration acted illegally, foolishly, or both. Uh, and much of our time since has been trying to return to a uh, uh, lawful path. And I, there's a great irony here. You know, if a road forks, the classic Robert Frost road forking, when you're a professor, as I am, you can say, the mistake was made back in 2003. If only we hadn't done X or Y. If only we hadn't invaded Iraq. You'd be right, and then go get another cookie from the faculty lounge. When you're in the government, you're already down the wrong path. You're already gone down the wrong fork. And your job is to move that second path toward where it should be. And it takes a long time. And while you're on that path, there'll be people saying, see, you're still on the, right, the same path. You must be just like the other guys. And the answer is, don't you see, we're trying to bend it toward law. We're trying to bend it toward justice. We can't go back. We have to go forward. And that's what, you know, at, at this point, um, we're many years past these original mistakes. And they were mistakes. They were, they were grotesque mistakes. But the job now is to get this into uh, a better frame. What I've stated here is let's not buy into this fiction that there are no rules. There are rules. And let's not be confused if there are times when these rules are violated by the people who are implementing them, because then you can say these rules have been violated. But we should also be clear that there are emerging rules that meet these new situations, and we're not in a law-free zone. Michelle, I wonder whether you wanted to come in on any points, but particularly maybe on the cyber mm -hmm. space issue, because last year the Netherlands hosted the Global Conference on Cyberspace, and there the conference highlighted the need to explore the development of voluntary non-legally binding norms for responsible state behavior in cyberspace. I wonder whether such efforts undermine international law by offering states a less rigorous path to dealing with this issue. But maybe you might have some thoughts on this. Well, I can only give uh, a judicial perspective on how to tackle cybercrime. Uh, cybercrime is uh, uh, one of the three priorities in the European Union. Uh, besides um, uh, terrorism uh, and illegal immigrant smuggling, it's uh, among the top priorities. And it is, uh, per definition, a, a borderless uh, crime, uh, as has been uh, underlined. Uh, um, we see a massive use uh, of um, um, uh, the internet and social media. Um, 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 encrypted uh, messages used by terrorism. We see that uh, traffickings of all kinds are taking place uh, um, on the dark nets. Uh, we have had uh, last year some uh, operations run together with the United uh, States uh, uh, in um, um, uh, tackling the Tor network, uh, in uh, tackling uh, uh, different uh, malware uh, producers. Uh, um, this is part of reality. Um, uh, not uh, later than last year, the World Economic Forum um, uh, established a, a steering committee with different players from the public and the private sector in order to see how together we can tackle uh, cybercrime um, um, across the borders and across the sectors. Uh, um, um, again, this year in uh, Davos, uh, a lot of attention was uh, given uh, to the role of law enforcement uh, uh, authorities and judicial authorities. Uh, there are different ways uh, to tackle the problem, uh, but the multidisciplinary way, bringing together all the um, 
uh, expertises, uh, uh, having um, uh, exercises, simulations, uh, being prepared to face the worst case uh, scenario is part uh, of the exercise uh, run and monitored by this uh, steering committee. Uh, we have to get prepared uh, uh, altogether. We know that defense is indeed having a lot of uh, know-how and expertise. Uh, well, let's benefit from that uh, expertise. Let's benefit uh, from uh, the expertise uh, available. Uh, but as been said for the, the previous uh, uh, the discussions, uh, uh, the solution might not be found in one um, 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 uh, way or another. It is by having on a specific uh, a problem um, a well thought and reflected uh, solution. But the solution is certainly to be found in a cooperation again. Let me take a, another round of three questions. Is that in front? If Thank you, Lou Gagliano. I'm an independent consultant dealing with technology. The question that I'd like to pose is, is to take the Apple situation and apply it to the EU, where the EU Commission is, is responsible for establishing regulations as to privacy uh, standards. Uh, and let's assume for the moment that in, in respect to what just happened in Belgium, that the, a phone, an Apple phone, uh, was critical uh, in terms of uh, detection of what may or may not have happened. How would the EU regulations apply to the Apple, uh, an Apple-like situation uh, in the EU's uh, uh, Belgian um, uh, uh, tragedy? Okay, good. And then there's a, the lady, yes. Hi, um, I'm a student at American University. Um, uh, Professor Ko, you talked about areas of the law that had need to be translated um, for to today's world and areas of the law that are law-free zones, like you called them. And I was wondering if that necessity for translation implies some um, inherent inadequacy of the law and why there isn't a concentrated effort to update international law um, to fit better with the modern world and why we're relying on what seems to be an outdated system, or if you, if you disagree and think it's not. Okay. And then we'll go to the back way at the... The last row, the gentleman with the red tie at the back row. Yes, uh, <clears throat> my name is David Sedney with CSIS, formerly with the U.S. Uh, State and Defense Departments. And my question is for Professor Koh. Uh, you laid out a set of differences between the Bush and Obama administrations. However, since I left the U.S. government in discussions with people who are not part of the United States government, uh, I've, uh, people have raised the issue of what are called signature strikes. The International Crisis Group uh, did a paper a year or so ago describing these uh, alleged signature strikes, saying that there are greater civilian casualties involved with them than there are with other kinds of <coughs> such strikes. Uh, as you laid out your uh, 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 validation under international law, the use of drones, uh, does that... Uh, does, does your justification for those extend to these so-called signature strikes? Again, I'm not making any statement whether this, such strikes occur or not. Okay, thank you. Um, Michelle, why didn't um, I start with you, maybe on the EU regulations? Well, I think that uh, there are ongoing Microsoft. discussions, and the one who should respond to this uh, question is certainly uh, Commissioner Jourova uh, from uh, Justice. Uh, now, what I do know is uh, from uh, a law enforcement perspective uh, and from a criminal justice ex uh, perspective is that we have to step up uh, the dialogue and judicial cooperation with the United States. And hence, uh, the United States has uh, taken up its responsibility, has sent a liaison prosecutor experience in cybercrime uh, to Eurojust uh, to ensure the dialogue and the judicial cooperation, accelerated judicial cooperation between the US uh, and the European uh, Union. We need action reaction and rapid reaction. And through the presence of an experienced uh, cybercrime prosecutor, we have this kind uh, of uh, reactions. Uh, um, uh, you all know that uh, um, uh, all the um, um, service providers are situated on uh, the US uh, soil, uh, that we need the rapid uh, access uh, to digital and uh, electronic uh, evidence. Well, this has been um, um, something we have been working on and it is leading to a gradual uh, success. It's for the decision making at uh, the highest level, the just level, uh, I'm not the one who's going to answer. Harold? So to uh, our friend from AU, uh, uh, there are no law-free zones. Uh, I didn't distinguish between 
translated zones and law-free zones. I said that people try to call things law-free zones and they're not. I believe in universal human rights and there is no zone in which human rights law does not operate. Why don't we have a better process of updating it? Uh, look at our political environment. We have a Congress that can't legislate. We have a Congress that won't ratify treaties even if they were negotiated. We have an international process that rarely renegotiates treaties or updates them to the current situation. Um, and we have a veto system and a UN system in which certain states have disproportionate and sometimes preclusive power, which means that a formal process of updating rarely occurs. Which means that if we're gonna, technology moves faster than law, that we have to develop these rules through interpretation. And uh, that's what these rules that I laid out were. I mean, um, what I gave you is drawn from uh, lots and lots of different sources. And what I'm saying is, the fact that someone can't figure this out doesn't mean it's a law-free zone. It means that they didn't figure it out or that someone didn't lay it out clearly enough. Now, David Sedney asked a very good question about signature strikes. So, so let's be clear that there, the original theory of targeted killing is personality strikes, in which you know who the person is, and they are a senior leader of Al-Qaeda who is attacking you, the paradigm case being Osama bin Laden. Now, the original notion of a signature strike is, can you strike at someone when you don't know that 100% sure that they're there, but all their signatures are there. And in that sense, the raid against bin Laden was a signature strike because they didn't actually know 100% that he was there. They didn't, never saw him. It's just that all of his signatures were present. So in the original sense, my view is that a genuine signature strike in which the signatures are a substitute for correct identification of a legal target, it's lawful. What I think has been troubling, though, is the notion of using the notion, okay, look, signature strikes are lawful, to suddenly say, okay, then a house draped in a particular way that could be Al-Qaeda means you can attack the house without knowing anybody who's in there. Or that certain indicia allow you to do a broad attack without any real sense of who's there. So for example, two weeks ago, uh, there was an attack on 150 people at an Al-Shabaab camp. The Defense Department said, um, we're not at war with Al-Shabaab. Um, this has to be explained by self-defense. They were going from a graduation ceremony to do an attack, but we don't know more than that. Now, if we're in a war with al-Shabaab, we should say we're in an armed conflict with al-Shabaab and produce the information that shows that all of al-Shabaab is interested in fighting the United States as opposed to various internal objectives within Africa. If what we're doing is a signature strike, you have to explain why someone there, an individual, a personality, met a targeted killing standard and why you believe that there's a near certainty of no civilian casualties. So again, um, I'm not saying that the rules have been perfectly applied in every situation. In fact, there may be situations that prove why we need to get these rules even more clearly defined, because otherwise the word signature could be expanded or misused in a way that people can't recognize. Good. Another round of questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jerry, <clears throat> excuse me, Jerry Bass. I'm retired, one of the few non-lawyers in D.C. Um, regarding, you know, the, the wars and, you know, wars changed now, certainly, and it's easy for, you know, and it's good that we have rules of engagement, et cetera, because I think, you know, people should have guidelines and rules. But, you know, unless you're there and under, you know, stress or attack, you'll see rules differently than others, possibly, you know, of, of how you have to defend yourself, et cetera. And nowadays with what's happening with uh, a lot of uh, hiding behind civilians, you know, i.e. We, we hit a hospital, I think, in, uh, in uh, Iraq, you know, you know, that's something because 
possibly there was something there, but maybe we just made a mistake. Uh, in Israel, we see Gaza with the you know missiles being fired, and on the other side of that, you know, having to go back and hit a hospital or hit a school or something that that may be hiding those missiles to protect. With hindsight, it's easy to sit back and look at things, but we don't. We do things differently sometimes too. You know, I, we probably would have done something different, possibly in in Syria, if we had known 250,000 people would have been killed earlier on. So, how do you, you know, there's all these gray areas, but how do you justify the gray areas in all of this with setting up the rules of of, of war, uh, where now civilian casualties unfortunately happen? I think. The drones actually, if I recall, killed 1,500 or 2,000 innocent civilians. It was recorded in the early Obama years, uh, and maybe they've changed you know, some of that. So, okay, thank you. And there's a lady at the back with a, a pink uh, outfit. Then we'll take a third. Hi, Caitlin Mastro, PhD uh, candidate at Cornell University. My question is for Professor Ko. Um, I'm interested in how you define international norms in regards to international law. And if you or do you see counterterrorism laws ever reaching this threshold? Okay, thank you. And the third question, the gentleman, second row. Thank you, uh, Lee Roberts. I'm a student at George Mason University. Uh, my question is for both panelists and pertains to one aspect of 21st century warfare that Professor Coe listed, but upon which uh, he did not dwell, uh, namely special operations regarding a specific instance. Um, as Professor Coe alluded to, in 2011, the United States launched a raid uh, into Pakistan to kill or capture Osama bin Laden. While the service members who conducted the raid were technically under the administrative control of the CIA, whom the Pakistani government had approved to operate within the country, I believe I'm reasonable in saying that this distinction is lost on the world and indeed on Pakistan itself, who protested a violation of its sovereignty by the American military, but did not protest too loudly or too long due to the shakiness of their position in light of bin Laden's discovery in Abbottabad. Is the bin Laden raid apparently tacitly approved by the preponderance of the global community, an anomalous moment that's unlikely to serve as precedent? Does the effective violation of a state's sovereignty by unapproved special operations have implications, or is this really yet to be determined? Thank you. Howard? Um, so first to um, uh, the question that was asked by uh, my colleague, I think the fog of war is greatly diminished by the internet. Um, we didn't have an internet at the Cultural Revolution. We didn't have an internet at the bombing of Dresden. We didn't have an internet when they dropped atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And thousands and thousands of innocent civilians died. But it was placed under the notion of a fog of war. Now everybody has a cell phone. Everybody has a video camera. Many of those people have access to the internet. Claims can be rebutted. But also, by the way, claims can be repeated without verification. For example, you said X number of people were killed by drone. The United States has not confirmed or denied those numbers. I know they actually dispute how high the numbers are. So it's worth having some clarification of this point. It seems to me that um, we are in a period now in which if someone attacks a hospital claiming it's not really a hospital, but is actually a place in which it's a disguised attack center or command and control center, you can verify that with modern technology in a way that was not possible before. To the, my friend from Cornell, are you an international relations major or a law student? Or? So international relations has long had the notion of regime theory um, Peter Katzenstein, what you professor? Norms, rules, and decision making procedures underlying a particular issue area, they don't use the word law. Um, but the notion of norms is sort of shared principles. When those are bodied into either treaty or customary international law, they become law under the statute of the International Court of Justice. What I'm suggesting here is a set of emerging norms that I think should be law. And that involves subjecting them to a lawmaking exercise, or simply being asserted as a matter of law rather than a matter of discretionary policy. Now, finally, 
Um, when Abby asked me at the beginning, what are areas of controversy? One is what's unable or unwilling, right? And the question you asked put it exactly right. Did Pakistan consent to the raid uh, on bin Laden, or were they simply unable or unwilling to prevent him from attacking the US from Abbottabad? We don't know. But um, in that situation, the US action was essentially done, it seems, with some sort of tacit uh, acceptance by the Pakistani government. Now, some people would want more approval, formal approval, by the Pakistani government. You're unlikely to get it. Um, if, but as you say, if the Pakistani government um, is objecting to their sovereignty being invaded, why did they let an acknowledged leader of Al Qaeda be in a country where they claimed that they were not harboring terrorists, right? Now that explains why some of these concepts in can be stated with some legal precision, but the proof of the pudding is in the application, which is a lot harder. Good, Michelle. No comment. Another round of questions. It's an honor. Thank you guys for coming today. Uh, my name is Jordan Barth. I am a senior at American University studying government. Um, and my question is for the both of you. What um, do you see as the role of the media um, in this new 21st century war? Okay, thank you. Good question. Gentlemen, Tim. Uh, good morning. My name is Dave Grosso. I'm a retired special operations senior leader, and I appreciate your comments about the United States military not uh, pursuing actions that are unlawful, unconstitutional. I guess my question will be to you, Professor, uh, concerning the authorization of military force. Uh, does the current provisions and authorizations portend or, or to cover future actions on the continent of Africa? against enemies such as Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, Al-Qaeda, and the Maghreb, uh, and other actions? Or is there additional work that needs to be done in, ter in terms of assessment interpretation of the AUMF? Thank you. Good. Michel, any thoughts on the role of the media? Well, I like this question very much. Uh, we need uh, a proper dialogue with uh, the media. The impact uh, of uh, incorrect uh, information uh, be devastating on ongoing operations criminal investigations and prosecutions uh, sometimes even lead to, to uh, the uh, nullity of uh, criminal uh, proceedings uh, and hence uh, leading to uh, potential risks uh, for future uh, e events. Uh, also the aspect of the social media where uh, every citizen becomes a journalist without any control, without any uh, uh, frame uh, uh, where a lot of um, incorrect or correct information might be disseminated in a minimum time also having an impact. Uh, what I heard from law enforcement uh, units uh, being operational in Paris and Brussels is that uh, operations uh, uh, cannot be hidden from the media any longer and become part of a reality show, putting in danger uh, the police uh, men, uh, law enforcement authorities on the spot, uh, um, uncovering also um, uh, activities which should uh, uh, remain um, uh, out of the eyes uh, of the society at large, uh, and hence uh, uh, give uh, more possibilities uh, for terrorists and new ideas, creative ideas for terrorists in the future. So a good dialogue. Uh, so see, you know, what, what are the, the, the ways we can uh, work together? Uh, what do you need uh, to know? What must uh, society know at this point uh, in time? Uh, that would be, I think, a very good. Uh, So on the media, I think Michelle has done a good job distinguishing. You know, every tool is double-edged. The media is a huge human rights enforcement device and has done an extraordinary job, I think, in illustrating human rights abuses that are being unaddressed. Uh, on the other hand, the media has uh, a role to play in holding our leaders accountable, and sometimes it hasn't done a very good job. For example, when presidential candidates talk about torturing people, the obvious question is, 
if you take an oath to be president, you'll swear to uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States of America. Are you telling me that you intend to violate that oath immediately? And if so, why don't you let that be known now so people can decide whether they want to vote for a president who's going to be an outlaw immediately? Uh, they don't ask that question. Instead, they move to other things that are more um, colorful or in their own mind or get better ratings. And I, I think that's been a failure. To uh, my colleague who uh, worked on special operations, um, as I said, uh, the authorization for use of military force is supposed to address associated forces, which include co-belligerents, which are organized armed groups that have entered the conflict against the United States. And I don't believe that either Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab as an en entirety meet those standards. The problem, though, which I know you understand better than anybody, is that um, we have a Congress that refuses to vote an authorization for use of military force. Um, this is quite remarkable because this is the exact same Congress that accuses other branches of usurping their power. Um, it's their job to authorize force and set its limits and define who we're fighting against. And they absolutely refuse to do that. So um, obviously, they could be too busy doing other things like voting on Supreme Court candidates, but uh, <laughs> I guess they're not interested in doing that either. So um, um, that's too bad. But I think the point that is absolutely critical is I do not know any military unit of the United States government that has ever gone into the field without clarification from their commanders, what are our rules of engagement? And part of those rules of engagement are set by the Geneva Conventions and the laws. And I don't know of any commander, uh, and we have a large number of extraordinary heroic people who do that unless it's absolutely clear that they're conducting things that are consistent with the oath that they took when they joined the US military. So um, if we're going to hold soldiers to that standard, we ought to hold our commander in chiefs to that standard. In fact, it would be interesting to know how many of our presidential candidates could give you uh, a, a recital of the laws under which they're operating. I, I know one candidate who could tell you essentially 100% of that. Um, the others, I think, couldn't. Um, and I think that's what makes her an extraordinary figure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, yes. well, I take a, a, a final round of questions. I saw the lady. Thanks. Elisa Massimino with Human Rights First. I don't want to beat a dead horse on this AUMF thing, but, um, and it's, I can't believe I'm going to say these words, but to be fair to Congress, uh, you know, one of the, there are some members of Congress who are trying to push forward, uh, Senator Kane, Senator uh, Flake, the, um, a new AUMF to govern uh, uh, the, the new conflict that we seem to be in. And, um, but, you know, it doesn't help when the president says, I want Congress to do this, but I don't actually need Congress to do it because I have the authority I need under the old AUMF um, or AUMFs. Uh, and so given the situation with Congress and that there's not much progress uh, being made by these two lone senators trying to push this forward, um, what do you think the administration could do before it leaves office to at least um, illuminate what it sees as the constraints on its use of military force? You know, we've had so many hearings where administration representatives come and are asked, who are we at war with? Um, and, uh, and they can't really give an answer. And that seems to me to be contributing to a lot of the debate that we have about drones and other kinds of issues that would be a lot more clear if there were a meeting of the minds between the American people and the government about who we're at war with. Good, thank you. My question is how long prisoners or detainees in Guantanamo can be kept? In the past, when a war ended, prisoners of war were released shortly thereafter. Can people in Guantanamo be kept as long as we have a conflict with terrorists? Okay. The final question. Yes, the lady. 
My name is Jennifer Clark. I'm a research associate at the Public International Law and Policy Group. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the legality of drone warfare. My question is more about the efficacy of decapitation as a strategy and what your impressions are as far as the effectiveness. Okay. Good. Thank you. Harold? So I think Elisa asked, uh, her organization, Human Rights First, has done uh, heroic work on uh, trying to get Congress to live up to its responsibilities. Uh, I, I think the administration actually has been pretty clear. They believe that under their interpretation of the uh, 2001 AUMF, the administration has authority to fight ISIL, in addition to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Steve Preston, the former general counsel of the Defense Department last year at this American Society of International Law meeting said that the list is exhausted. In other words, Boko Haram's not on it, Shabab, Shabab's not on it. And they acknowledge that with regard to Shabab, there may be some leaders of Shabab who are members of Al-Qaeda. And I think that's been true for, you know, there were at least five senior leaders of Shabab who had sworn bayat to Al-Qaeda, and this was massively documented. Um, but I think the, the answer, if you just rely on that, is um, they can continue to fight Al-Qaeda, they can continue to fight the Taliban, they continue to fight ISIL, but if they're going to actually declare new theaters or fight against new enemies, they need new authority. Um, and um, I don't think that the administration is, you know, the, the administration is not in the business of saying there are people who might, we might have to fight who we don't have authority to fight against. So they haven't been explicit about it. But if you see what have been the limits of what they've stated, uh, it's, it's absolutely clear. Um, you can hold prisoners till the end of armed conflict, and we're still in an armed conflict with Al Qaeda and the Taliban. Um, you actually have to demonstrate that those individuals continue to pose a threat, and some people who have been held for 13 years can be reevaluated under the periodic review board, the executive order on periodic review, and released. And what we see happening now is that the number of 91, they say they're going to drop it by 17 in the next few weeks. If they remove all tr cleared for transfer people, you'll be down to 45 by the end of the summer. Um, and then we're suddenly in a zone where uh, the question is exactly what's going to happen. The president says he doesn't want to leave this for the next president, which I hope is true. Uh, and we'll see um, uh, what, what happens uh, with regard to Guantanamo. Um, my view is it should have been closed a long time ago. Um, I don't think it makes any sense for the United States to be running an offshore prison camp particularly if the claim is it's outside the scope of law. Those claims that it was outside the scope of law have been completely rejected by the Supreme Court, so now it's fully subject to law. And um, we don't want other countries to be opening up their offshore prison camps, which they claim are outside the scope of law. That's just more legal black holes. So um, Guantanamo never should have been opened. There's no reason to bring anybody there. So presidential candidates who say bring people to Guantanamo, why on earth would you do that? I, I'm amazed by this. People who are in Syria, why on earth would you bring them 90 miles to the United States at a time when we are criticizing the other part of Cuba for holding people indefinitely and without due process of law? This is the most ludicrous suggestion you can imagine. And this administration has brought nobody new to Guantanamo. So the numbers have been dropping slowly, much more slowly than they should have been. But um, uh, Guantanamo never should have been open. Guantanamo should be closed. And once closed, it should be closed forever. Michelle, why don't I give you the last word? No? All right. Well, this has been a fascinating um, conversation. And I'd like to, to thank both our panelists, uh, Harold Kaur and Michelle Cummings, for being with us today and, and for the open and stimulating way you've engaged with the audience. So s please do join me in thanking our two panelists. <laughs>